Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jim Kircher. Self-driving cars are no longer the stuff of science fiction. Self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, I'm tempted to say they are literally right around the corner, but maybe not. And it's not just my driving habits and yours that will change. There's a lot more potentially far-reaching impacts of this technology. So joining me in the studio are Robbie Diamond, who is the founder, president, and CEO of Securing America's Future Energy, also known as SAFE. Ben Johnson is here. He is BioSTL's VP of Programs and chairman of the National Innovation Advocacy Council. And joining us by phone is Maureen Westfall, executive director of the Partnership for Transportation, Innovation, and Opportunity. Robbie, Ben, Maureen, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the program. You know, I bought a new car three years ago, and I began to wonder if maybe this was the last car I was going to buy uh, that I would drive myself. And I don't mean because the kids were going to take the keys away, although that could happen before self-driving cars arrive. But there's a lot of stuff that's going to impact when these new technologies, which are some of them are already here, impacting lifestyle, economy, jobs, safety, all of this. We'll get to... uh, Robbie and Maureen, but Ben, you're with BioSTL, and I'm thinking, okay, life science stuff and innovation and all of that. What's the interest in uh, the business community uh, that uh, in this particular topic? Because I guess it's going to hit a lot of areas. Very much so. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for having us today. Um, you know, innovation of all types uh, holds the promise for improving lives, and St. Louis, uh, the Midwest in general, have been in the forefront of innovation. Industrial innovation uh, from St. Louis really drove economic growth for the U.S. and, and the globe, and especially around the automobile, whether that was manufacturing here uh, or the birth of the interstate system right here in St. Louis. And what better place than the Midwest and St. Louis in particular for a dialogue about ve- vehicle autom- auto automation. I'm going to get that word right before yeah, we're we'll done here to today. There terms, we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's importance. And, uh, and St. Louis really is a, a, a resurging hub for innovation uh, and an opportunity to embrace autonomous vehicles and automation in general to put St. Louis back at the forefront and to do so with an eye toward what are the community impacts, the workforce and the safety and accessibility. And BioSTL, as you reference, our genesis and our grounding really is in medical and plant sciences, where St. Louis has a unique global strength in those areas. But more and more of our work to drive innovation and entrepreneurship uh, in the region, whether that's policy, workforce, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, or recruiting companies to St. Louis bleeds into other innovation areas. Innovation blurs the lines bef- between sectors. And so that's why we've been excited to, to join with Robbie and SAFE, as well as Marine and PTIO, to, uh, to bring this uh, St. Louis further into this dialogue about innovation and autonomous vehicles uh, and their impacts. Yeah, and you have an event tomorrow at the Moto Museum tomorrow morning to, to talk about this very thing. Marine Westfall's on the phone. She's with Partnership for Transportation, Innovation, and Opportunity. Let's just talk about the technology right now. Um, Cars have a lot more stuff than they used to when I bought my first, I hate to say, Rambler. But um, where are we right now in this? Is this really literally around the corner, or is the corner 10, 20 years away? Maureen? That's a great question, Jim. Um, You know, PTIO and its members, which include the American Trucking Association, Daimler, FedEx, Ford, Lyft, Toyota, Uber, and Waymo uh, know that a future with autonomous vehicles is coming. Um, but fortunately, we have the benefit of time to be, in, begin preparing. Um, so we know that there will be many significant benefits like safer roads, greater access to mobility, uh, reduced gridlocked, improved environment, just to name a few. Um, but what our coalition is focused on primarily is the recognition that it may change the way many of us work. So we see many career pathways, new occupations, greater efficiencies in the transportation sector, just to name a few of the opportunities as well as the challenges that are coming and right around the corner, as we say. Um, But at the same time, what we've seen with the adoption of any new technology in the past, um, we know that autonomous vehicles may alter some aspects of certain occupations and may reduce the need for others over time. So with all those issues in mind with pending technology, our members launch PTIO to initiate this open conversation about the future of work and how we can help workers specifically transition. Um, So our immediate actions include the listening and learning mode. So we've been engaging with stakeholders around the country to learn more about their unique situations and begin building a path forward. 
and that's what brought us to St. Louis this week. So we'll be working with SAFE and BioSTL to talk a lot about, with your local community, the impact of this technology on the workforce specifically. Robbie Diamond with Securing America's Future Energy. Uh, why don't you weigh in on this? Where are we on this? And, you know, we talk about jobs being created, jobs being lost. Um, there has to be some opposition as well. I mean, there are certain people fighting to keep jobs, keep things as they are, or running maybe moving a little more slowly than other people would like to move. Right. So uh, thank you for having me, Jim. Um, just Briefly, Securing America's Future Energy is focused on ending oil dependence for economic and national security, with every major recession in the United States being preceded by an oil price spike, as well as most of our foreign policy entanglements. And we believe it's the connection of autonomous and electric and other types of uh, propulsion systems together that will help solve this problem. That's why we care about autonomous vehicles. Um, I think your listeners should think about this more broadly than just autonomous vehicles. Uh, some companies uh, make acronyms, and so there's a bunch of acronyms. One is CASE, Connected Autonomous Shared and Electric, or ACES, Autonomous Connected Electric and Shared. And it's really the force multiplier of all these things happening at the same time that will change the way we live our lives, um, how we get around. Um, one can think about just uh, changes going on with batteries, artificial intelligence, and telecommunications, and those things. So even Uber and Lyft. Um, have now overtaken uh, rental car companies for expenses for workers when they go to a city. That is a fundamental change. So I don't think we only have to think about um, every car driving itself everywhere all the time. Uh, cars can be what's called geofenced into specific areas like uh, gated communities, um, downtown, downtown areas. Uh, trucks, as we had heard about, could uh, go on highways and be connected to one another and sort of make like trains of, of trucks. So we'll see lots of changes happening because there's so, uh, so, so much value. You asked about people being positive and negative. I think if people don't realize a positive world that they don't see right now, they're going to be negative. And, uh, and humans, I think, are predisposed to be scared of new technology. And so what we do need to talk about are those keys that will be taken away from yourself that you mentioned in the beginning. How many people are, have done that to their parents and are now scared of that happening to them? Or we showed that 2 million people who are uh, disabled couldn't get jobs and now will be able to get to work. Um, we could save 37,000 lives on our roads. Talk about an epidemic. So I think there are so many positive reasons to do this, and it's really for us to have this dialogue to both discuss the positive and then take into account the negatives. But you're going to see, you already are seeing changes in your vehicles. You're seeing biz new business models, and that's just going to accelerate. We have a lot of new technologies. You know, it tells you when um, someone's in your blind spot. You're using your GPS to tell you where to turn and giving you traffic updates. Uh, the next step in my mind, you'd mentioned connectivity. Are the cars, are our vehicles talking to each other yet? So more and more they are. I mean, there's a big fight about spectrums and how they do that. But yes, they are able to talk to each other. And really the question for the country is how do you accelerate that? Cars that talk to each other don't crash into each other. You said that a lot of uh, parts are being added to your car. It, the irony is an electric vehicle has no parts. It has 20 parts as opposed to uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. But at the same time, software is being added to your car. And there's just so much software in these more uh, communication types of, of, uh, of pieces. So as, at the same time that we're taking uh, parts out, we're sort of adding uh, some, uh, some complexity. But I, I, I really think that the faster we get to our vehicles talking to each other, that's 37,000 lives because people are addicted to their phones. I mean, they're willing to drive a essentially a killing machine. You know, it's thousands of pounds barreling down a highway at 80 miles an hour, and yet you look down at a text. And just think about that. So the faster we uh, make it so that cars are talking to each other, the more lives we'll save. Yeah, ben, when you talk about a local economy um, and people moving, for example, one of the, one of the, the predictions is that the ownership of cars, uh, personal ownership, might go down, that you'd have a combination of autonomous vehicles and, and, uh, and a ride service, Uber or Lyft, co combining into that. So we have car dealers, we have insurance companies, we have parking garage income. Uh, if people don't buy cars, license fees go down, all of that. So it would seem to me that um, municipalities, governments, have to be looking at what they gain and what they lose in this. 
I, I think that's a critical part of the dialogue, as, as Robbie referenced. That's part of this conversation coming to St. Louis and coming to the Midwest. Um, what are those changes that, whether it's autonomous vehicles or any new innovation, will be bringing to our economy, and how do we retool for that? Um, how do we position the St. Louis region uh, and its talent, its workforce, and its communities um, for the next generation of innovation? Um, and, uh, and how do we help those, particularly those um, who might be most vulnerable to changes in the economy, help them skill up uh, in workforce. Uh, and Maureen uh, will talk, can talk further about that. Uh, but how do we be, is a St. Louis economy looking forward and ahead of the curve on innovation uh, rather than looking backwards and reacting to innovation? Yeah, well, Maureen, why don't you join in on this? Because this will be something of an upheaval. You know, we talk about, you know, buggy whip makers. Uh, in a previous generation, or bicycle makers uh, turning into, or wagon makers turning into automobile makers. How big of a uh, upheaval might this be in um, how we work and what kind of jobs we have? Well, it's a really important point, and it's something that is, you know, at the foundation of our coalition. You know, Missouri ranks 30th in job growth right now, and so communities and local governments have to consider how this new technology will impact their economies and their greater workforce. Um, you know, for example, there are 1.4 million people under the age of 18 in Missouri, and we have to be concerned with retaining and then retraining those individuals as they graduate from high school, post-secondary programs. The future of Missouri's economy really depends on it. So we have some room for improvement among working-aged adults with post-secondary education training. Um, and the coalition is really interested in working with the state and local governments, um, as well as academics and stakeholders such as workforce development, um, to begin preparing those workers, both current workers and future workers, for what the new economy will bring. So it's a really important part of PTIO's mission. Um, for example, we recently released a guidance document on research priorities because we believe strongly that we need to build an uh, evidence-based understanding of the potential impact on communities, you know, taking into account regional distinctions, um, and then base some public policy on that evidence-based understanding. So we're looking at three different issue areas. First, you know, how will AV technology impact the workforce at large? So understanding what training needs and delivery is needed. Um, second, understanding training needs um, to ensure a smooth workforce transition. So how are we going to transition all of these people and what are the best ways to deliver it in each community throughout the country? Um, and then finally, we need to study the quality of life improvements. So specifically how AV technology will improve your workforce's quality of life. So what PTIO is looking to do with our partners is paint a complete picture of what is needed to prepare for this AV future. Okay, lots um, more to talk about, and we will, but uh, it's time to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a moment. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. Now back to our conversation about the potential impacts of self-driving technology with Ben Johnson, Maureen Westfall, and Robbie Diamond. I see this as a couple of ways and a couple of different forces at work here. We have the traditional automobile companies, American companies, European companies, BMW is big, the Japanese car companies, moving this along. Uh, in an incremental way, adding more and more things. And then you have the tech center that says, we're just going to go ahead and do it. So Google's going to do it, or Amazon's going to do it, or Elon Musk is going to do it outside of that. So we have sort of a, are, are, could, could I say these are opposing forces at this point? Are there two different approaches to autonomous vehicles, one incremental and one more revolutionary? <laughs> I think that uh, several of the developments over the last 10 years have really woken the auto industry to the risks that they face if they don't get ahead of it. And that is because of the tech industry. I think Tesla and its success coming out of Silicon Valley, uh, whether you believe it's a financial success or not, but as a car company, as an iconic brand, uh, they really were woken up to see that car companies could be started because, as I, as I said before, there are not many parts. And then you have Waymo. 
which comes out of Google that creates the autonomous car. And they are sitting on lots and lots of monies, not being low margin businesses like the current auto companies. So the auto companies are in a desperate fight to both sell a product today where they make money and then figure out the future and compete with an incredibly um, an incredible group of competitors. So, so they must have divisions who are working on that. They do, but I think that in some ways they're at a bit of a disad- they've been at a di- bit of a disadvantage because this is all about software and what do they have? They have mechanical and uh, engineers and other types of uh, you know they don't have the software engineers needed. So there's a bit of a talent gap. There's also a bit of a culture gap um, in the way they do things, and this is why you've seen such such monumental. Dis- uh, announcements from some of these companies where, you know, Ford or GM say that they'll no longer really sell um, uh, small cars, they're going to sell big cars. Well, that's because they're funding through the profits of larger cars at the moment, you know, Cruise, which is, you know, this autonomous electric, you know, unit that uh, GM, G- GM has or Ford. This is providing capital for them to fight for this uh, future because they know if they don't do it, they'll get crushed. Maureen, how do you see that? Um the, those sectors, the, the traditional auto industry, modernizing, moving ahead, as, and the, the, the tech companies saying, no, we're already ahead. And we're we're going to do this on our own. Well, with our membership, you know, we're comprised of leading innovators in this field, um, traditional, and then, you know, some more of what you would consider the startups. Um, but I think there's actually more in common with these members than is different. Um, So our members are really focused on, obviously, the technology, and that's very important to them. But at the same time, they're very thoughtful and taking a common sense approach to how these um, innovations will impact our communities. Uh, That's one of the reasons why all of these members came together to form PTIO. Uh, We're looking down the road, and fortunately, we feel that there is the benefit of time right now, but there won't be any action unless these large employers and large companies come together and begin laying the groundwork for what the future holds. Let's Um, talk uh, uh, very briefly. Uh, Tom is calling with something um, uh, that's really the the kind of news autonomous uh, autonomous vehicles are making right now. Tom, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Go Um, ahead. Your guest has a couple times trotted out a number about 37,000 deaths per year from uh, automobiles. I would contend that uh, based on the news of some crashes in test vehicles, that uh, the autonomous cars are killing more people per mile driven than uh, cars by distracted drivers. I dislike it when people misuse statistics and numbers to make a point that's invalid. Go ahead, respond. Yeah, I mean... (laughs) We focus, first of all, any technology has to get started somewhere, and it's for companies to responsibly uh, test and uh, deploy uh, their their vehicles. Um, It is true that uh, there's been uh, two deaths, uh, one by Uber and uh, and one uh, in Tesla um, that's happened. Um, But at the same time, as I said, we've become numb to these 37,000 other deaths. So the impact of of crashes on uh, not only the lives but on the economy is over $300 billion in the United States, both on injury and time out uh, of work. So what I'd say is we are at the beginning. It is for people to do this responsibly, but just think of that 37,000 deaths. We've had uh, year-on-year increases over the last few years while that's been going down. Now, why, you know, what, why is that happening? Well, one of the reasons is we are enamored by, uh, by distraction, and now we have the biggest distractor. So I just think that people uh, need to have uh, – companies need to act safely. The government needs to come out with a safety standard uh, to put these vehicles on the road. But at the same time, we can't move fast enough uh, to do it. Uh, well, computers are not distracted, and computers can see 360 degrees around them. Think of yourself – yeah, I think that the, the, the question might be about the transition. If you begin with autonomous vehicles mixed with drivers like me or drivers who are texting, you, you have a, a difficult transition uh, period. Maureen, you must get these questions a lot as well, that, that this technology isn't there. And if it's not there, maybe it's not safe. And maybe we ought to be very careful about moving ahead with this. Well, it is an understandable concern, and we obviously feel very strongly that there needs to be an open line of communication between these companies um, and the people that will be impacted by this technology. 
So it's important that consumers understand what precautions are being taken by companies, what the technology is, how they are working to ensure safeguards to, to provide safety to all users. Um, it's obviously at the forefront before anything else of these companies' minds is the safety of consumers of our communities. So Ben, these are sorts of questions that organizations in St. Louis or any other city are going to have to answer. And people are, there are some communities or or segments of our community that are pushing for change and others that are resistant and and fearful of change. And those are, those are legitimate points of view. So uh, that's a challenge. Yeah, very much so. It it is, is natural as we described any new innovation. It's natural to wonder how it's going to impact, uh, impact life. And I think uh, sort of two parallels to, to what Robbie described is the auto industry sort of waking up to the risks of the technology companies and, and then reacting or what you describe as this mixture of the time of mixing technology with the personal connection. Um, you know, St. Louis has a unique opportunity to be a leader in that dialogue. Um, you referenced, I have the, the fortune of chairing something called the Innovation Advocacy Council, a national group working to modernize innovation entrepreneurship policy where St. Louis le- has really has been a leading voice uh, in, on these issues at the, the federal level. Um, and one of the dialogues that we've been a part of is around an infrastructure bill. How, if our country's gonna invest, uh, or if the state of Missouri or St. Louis region are gonna invest in um, infrastructure, how do we do that? that mixing technology with the mechanical? Um, How do we ensure that the communication systems for self-driving cars so they can communicate with each other, those are established and invested? And how would that spur economic growth and startup growth in in a meaningful, uh, conscious way about how it impacts people? Um, And so we think there's a real opportunity for St. Louis to to be on the leading edge of these discussions as a resurging hub of innovation. Uh, Very quickly, as we kind of wrap this up, I'm wondering if we would expect to see see um, the advances come somewhere else first, in a place like Japan or Germany or China, um, before a, a huge country with lots of states and, and, and lots of issues might, might, might address this? So I actually think uh, the race is probably between uh, the United States and China, as uh, most things uh, these days. Um, both the race for autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles. Um, China has the ability to uh, you know, to roll things out quickly, and we have a much more competitive capitalist capitalist system. And a centralized system where they can just say, this is how it's going to be. Right. right. But then that's where you have problems potentially with safety. That's where you have problems with a lot of these things where we have companies that are held accountable for the mistakes they make, and therefore they both need to rush quickly but also not make those mistakes due to our, our court system. So I actually believe that uh, – You know, Europe is uh, in some ways uh, stuck in its own way, and they have a lot of uh, a lot too much regulatory. China might be a little too uh, uncautious, and the United States uh, might just have it right. But yes, we do need to solve this problem. How do you drive across 50 states if every state has its own laws for autonomous vehicles? Marine, what do you see coming in in the next? Well, you give me a time frame: five years, ten years. Uh, Where are we going? When will we get there? Well, as I said, the technology is obviously at the forefront of all of our members' minds, um, and we are also working on certainly the impacts to the community. Uh, we're really eager to be in the in St. Louis area tomorrow to talk with local government, elected officials, um, educators, and really bring the community together to have this conversation because this is not going to happen in a vacuum, and we all need to play a very important role over the next 5, 10, 30 years. Do you see other countries uh, getting there faster than we do? I don't think that we're at that point yet. Um, There's obviously a lot of competition, and we live in a very innovative world with all of these companies playing in the same field. So there's a lot of excitement around this issue, but a lot of preparation that needs to be made. Ben, what's the talk among municipalities and and even within the corporations here? Are the corporations saying, gosh, St. Louis needs to step up, or is St. Louis saying to the corporations, we need to address this? I think uh, both from uh, the the municipal side, the public sector, as well as the private sector side, you're seeing increasing conversation in St. Louis about the role of innovation as as a driver for our economic future. And and I think one of the, uh, again, one of the 
things that place St. Louis in the Midwest in a unique place is most of our conversation today is revolved around autonomous vehicles um, for individual use or transportation use. But this is uh, a conversation that bleeds into agriculture. One of the companies that our global STL program is recruiting from Israel is focused on AI and driverless uh, vehicles. We'll have uh, Dr. Pittman from the community college joining us on workforce tomorrow, but also Mary Lamy from the regional freightway talking about St. Louis as a logistics hub and how autonomous vehicles fit. And so I think the St. Louis region is uniquely positioned at the intersection of these sectors around new innovation, including autonomous vehicles, to really be a global leader in the discussion. I would just say that, you know, this is where the the interstate highway started. And think about that. The interstate highway shrunk geography. And when you shrink geography, you create huge amounts of economic opportunity. And right now, that is what autonomous vehicles are going to do. They, they shrink geography once again. It's the next – it's not uh, – geo. it's not it, – it's actually exponential growth that we'll see. Um, another thing is uh, most people live around waterways, right? And, uh, you know, of course, the river travel is, is, not as, is not as great as it used to be. But the idea of an autonomous electric uh, vehicle makes the inland to get on the outland – it's almost costless, Right, because uh, there's the lack of a uh, labor cost, there's lack of a uh, fuel cost, there's lack of uh, this parts question that I have. So I actually think for the Midwest, it's actually quite uh, rejuvenating of creating a manufacturing sector that links you to the rest of the world, because no longer will geography, you know, be the limiting lim- limiting factor. So where the interstate highway started, this is the next uh, revolution like that. Yeah, it seems to me that we could see this in very different ways. We could see something on the interstate that's very different than you would see in the center of the city coming at different times. So it's we tend to think of it as me in my car, you in your car, but this reaches far beyond that. So again, you've got a dialogue on vehicle automation and community impacts tomorrow morning at the Moto Museum, uh, 3441 Olive Street. I believe it's free, but you should go to Eventbrite, I guess, to, uh, to invite yourself. Uh, And so I really want to thank you guys for for joining us here today. Ben Johnson, Maureen Westfall, Robbie Diamond, it's a pleasure. The issue is just just beginning. We should have you back in five or ten years and see how things have gone. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.